and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host Jam, Luke Cutforth, and special guest Dr. Jamie Jammy Dodger Reigns. Yeah! This week we're talking about meta members. But first, we have a question for you. So if you're listening with your ears over on Apple or Spotify or anywhere else, come to YouTube, get down to the comments and answer this question. Have you ever had surgery? Mm. I think we asked that yes. recently. Asked it a few weeks ago, but I'm asking it again. Yeah, go on. Have you had any <laughs> surgery since? So our patrons chose bottom surgery, which is very broad as a topic for this month uh, yeah. because our patrons can choose topics every month and they vote on them. And it's very fun. You should join our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash guys to do do that but this month we'll be doing metoidioplasty because it's it's much easier to cover mm. just one of the kinds of bottom surgery rather yeah. than bottom surgery in general yeah. but first the question that i have for you all is what is bottom surgery oh is it surgery, surgery on, on a, a button crack <laughs> that's a, a very funny comment jab very funny but no it's not <laughs> surgery on a butt crack does anyone else have an answer it's no it's surgery on the general bottom not just the crack jab oh no. so ah, no so really what what is bottom surgery come on has anyone got an answer well i i do always find it funny when people think like oh you're talking about bottom surgery you'd surgery on your butt like yes i had a butt yeah. lift um it's it's uh, it's the Such other a plump side butt you have now <laughs> oh lovely peachy um it is Surgery on genitals. Mm -hmm. So yes. typically like the creation of a penis or a vagina, depending on how somebody's transitioning. Which one you Can want? Can I ask a question <laughs> there? A, a clarifying question. And this is a genuine question mm -hmm. because the definition you get there was quite broad. Would it be considered bottom surgery if somebody had surgery on their genitals that wasn't to do with reassigning um, their sex or like giving the appearance of reassigning their sex. I don't know. I guess just within, like, trans community, people mm. just generally, like, refer to bottom surgery, like, surgery on genitals as bottom surgery, just, like, mm. kind of top surgery. Like, the technical term would be, like, mm. a double mastectomy, but it's called top surgery because it's just a very, like, general, easy-to-say term. Mm -hmm. So I don't know yes. how that would be interpreted outside of the trans community. So, mm. Luke, I think the, the main thing here is that top surgery and bottom surgery aren't really medical terms at all. They're not... That no, no sorry, yeah. yeah. I was just catering to the fact that some people will be coming at this not uh, being sort of... Um, they'll come to the episode not being sort of as immersed in the trans world as we are. So they might think, with the definition being like, it's surgery on the genitals, they might think like a circumcision. Is that a form of bottom surgery? Or a labiaplasty? Is that a form of bottom surgery? So this is the interesting thing. Most of the surgeries that we think about as transgender surgeries mm. aren't, mm. I guess, necessarily unique to trans people. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, they're often they're amalgamations of and I mean quite literally amalgamations of other surgeries that are initially for cis or intersex people. Yeah. And then they realize, oh, this will be good for trans people also. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, as a fool, I guess, explanation of what bottom surgery is. Bottom surgery is, I guess, almost a counterpart to top surgery. And that's how you refer to a general group of surgeries when talking about them in generally trans and LGBT communities. So top mm -hmm. surgery would be the surgeries that you have on the top part of your body, chest surgeries, essentially, that doesn't really... People don't usually talk about facial feminization surgery when they're saying top surgery. Mm. And then mm. bottom surgery would be just your genital surgery, essentially, there. Yes. Yeah. So we know what bottom surgery is, generally, yeah? Broadly, yeah. Yeah. I'm it's, sure there are many types. Yeah, the, crea uh, the creation of a penis or a vagina, generally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. as Jamie has said. I'm not going to not gonna nick that from him. In the <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you cite him in the references. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, whilst researching for this episode, or actually, no, not for this episode, whilst researching for another episode, I came across Jamie's... <laughs> I came across Jamie's uh, paper that, y that you've published. You're <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> oh, cute. Yeah. You might be, so you might be in the references of another one. So I want to talk about <laughs> clitoral growth. I've never experienced it. <laughs> I, I know what it is. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I might have an idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I came across a study that's talking about the growth and development of the clitorophallus. And I just want to ask you what you think that's referring to, the clitorophallus. 
And I can give you a hint, actually, from the paper, if you'd like. Okay. Yeah. So here is a quote. It says, At the time of birth, one anatomic structure has historically been central to the immediate postnatal determination of sex and, for many decades, gender. The size of this structure on prenatal ultrasounds may lead parents to hypothesize elements of their future child's life course and decision-making around everything from names to room color. Alteration of this structure <laughs> is central to religious identity for some individuals and deeply offensive to others. Oh. This We're such weird creatures. <laughs> it is literally just referring to penises and clitorises oh. as as one structure. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, because it's not differentiated yet. I get well, it's you. not not I even because you. it's not differentiated yet. Because it's they're looking at it in this from this viewpoint of they both develop from the same structure right in the, yeah and, right. The, and because because there is such variation in size and i guess morphology as well that viewing them as two entirely separate structures as we do in our society yeah. is Whoa. limiting in some ways so this is just this is just this kind is gonna of have some people shook yeah yeah and this is why i wanted to bring up this paper initially because i think it it provides an interesting basis for what we're talking about today but i think that essentially what we're talking about here in terms of this paper it's just that categories thing Mm. that we speak about so often in that we view categories as reality and the categories that we use can really shape how we view certain topics so i guess understanding that the categories that we'd normally use aren't as strict and discreet as Mm. we would normally think is useful to understanding the topic that we're talking about today yes yeah i just think we should extend this to other things because i i I mean i remember so clearly learning that the for one of a better word what's the right scrotum no scrotum scrotum ball bag ball bag bag. Um, scrotum yeah that that the ball bag scrotum sorry is the same thing as the lay is it labia majora so you can like you can see all those that they all those 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 things are so differentiated um in most people they're, they 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 too come from the same structure, and I find that so interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so th- I mean, that's kind of I mean, I was gonna say you'll see why this is relevant in a bit, but you clearly already kind of see why what I'm talking about is relevant here. So the paper goes on to then defend its choice to use the term clitorophallus and brings up some I think pretty interesting points. And it's not to say that the term should be used in place of penis and clitoris. I it, I think it provides some utility in this context but obviously there are many other situations where using those individual terms is more useful than using this one unifying term Mm. and this is this is what i think is lost when you've got people that don't necessarily understand this quite as well or have knee-jerk reaction to this sort of stuff i think this is a point that's lost that saying that these categories are kind of human-made categories to put on to the the way that we see like sort of the things that we see in the world right that's not to say that the things that we see in the world don't exist and that's not to say that we can't use these categories at all it's just the understanding the recognition that sometimes using these two things as two completely distinct and separate categories is useful really useful and also the fact that we don't have a name which we now do have like for clitoral clitoral phallus just because there wasn't a name for it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist like it is, it's a thing. You've added a name to something, and we the way that we name things and the words we use are how we make sense of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and and, and uh, just to be absolutely clear, when they're talking about uh, when they're talking about clitorophallus, what they are talking about is just the structure in general. So the structure that in sort of I mean, what are they called? Fetuses in. <laughs> <laughs> unborn babies you know i always forget the babies. right words um, <laughs> the structure that can become a clitoris or a penis that is it, it makes sense to view that as one structure in yeah. some context that yeah. just differentiates mm. in two very different ways yeah, yeah. so uh, it, it talks about a number of different things and what's really interesting is that one of the main differences between uh the, the clitoris and the phallus is the is the urethra right the urethra is is sort of is separate from the clitoris but it's within the phallus but then there are also conditions wherein that's slightly less the case so have you heard of hypospadias no no I don't think so. Have no. you heard of an artist called Lil Dicky? Oh, yes, I have heard of him. He's called Lil Dicky. <laughs> He's called Lil Dicky. Yes. So Lil Dicky um, is a sort of rap, comedy rap artist. And yeah. he's... he's- He's got a TV show called Dave. Um, he's done. He's, he's he's quite good, and he's spoken about <laughs> hypospadias. I in in the show, his character has uh, hypospadia, and I believe 
in real life he does also it's essentially where the urethra the opening is not in the typical place for males it is uh on the underside the ventral side of the penis so it's a shortened oh, wow. urethra that has the opening in sort of an atypical place oh interesting i've yeah. never heard of that before so what this is kind of opening you up to is the idea that <laughs> the main difference between those two structures i mean the main difference between those two structures generally is size and urethra mm-hmm. right uh-huh. there's obviously that's there's obviously other differences as well I'm not, I'm not trying to say that they're exactly the same but when we're talking about main differences size and urethra are the two main differences yeah. yes yeah and yeah. yes absolutely if we're being if we're being totally fair and sort of i mean looking at just observationally at the at the sort of data that's in front of us it would be quite silly not to recognize that so it's really important to recognize that those structures are f- fundamentally very similar and there are only a few differences in the way that they develop that make them different but there are also people that are born that are sort of between those previously thought to be discrete categories right Mm -hmm. where the urethra is within the penis but not as long as is typical and the opening comes somewhere else and interestingly this is this is going to come into the whole topic as we sort of get into it yeah but what what they're talking what they're talking about to sort of defend their view is that if you look at the variation of human of humans and i know there's gonna be people in the comments talking about how intersex people aren't very common no no (laughs) the numbers that we use are obviously there's a difference in the sort of estimation of the percentage of people that are intersex usually it's between sort of i think one it's about one to 1.7 percent and then it could go as low as 0.15 or something along those lines or 0.18 and depending on what point you want to make people will use different different estimations yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because the different estimations generally come from a different definition of what counts as intersex mm-hmm. <laughs> and people will downplay sort of certain intersex i guess conditions in favor of sort of saying well actually they're mostly male typical or female typical anyway so counting them as intersex doesn't make sense yeah but essentially what i'm saying here is that because if you look at intersex people you can see that there is sort of there's not a distinct uh, there's not as distinct a difference between those structures as people would probably think from their general education throughout school Mm -hmm. yeah yes we're all happy in school you're taught like the two very different things on the opposite ends of the spectrum yeah you don't even tell there's a spectrum there's like two very opposite things you've got the two options yeah 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 Yeah. so (laughs) the paper then talks about something that's a little bit more relevant to today's episode and i'll just read this out as a quote endogenous testosterone essentially test testosterone that comes from within your body so Mm -hmm. (laughs) made by your body essentially endogenous testosterone and its more active metabolite dihydrotestosterone plays an important role in the development of the genital tubercule into the clitorophallus primarily during the prenatal and early postnatal periods and then again during puberty androgens contribute not only to the growth but also the inclusion of a urethra on the ventral aspect exogenous testosterone can be used to enlarge the small clitorophallus clitoris or micropenis as part of both intersex and gender affirming care in transmasculine payment Payment, uh, patients up to two centimeters of additional growth mm-hmm. so this is from a paper the role of androgens in clitorophallus development and possible applications to transgender patients it's from 2021 yeah it's pretty solid paper i would recommend giving it a look so that's just referring to bottom growth which is probably the more common term that you've heard it described as yeah it's Not kind me. of like, yeah it's kind of like the trans colloquial <laughs> slang if you mm-hmm. you know if you hang out with trans people you'll probably hear it at some point exactly yeah. Yeah. well i do hang out with trans people and they always call it their tea <laughs> that's another one that's <laughs> <laughs> which i think is a really fun really fun name so now that we understand all of that let's do some basics on metoidioplasty so it is mm-hmm. often called meta shortened down to meta it's a type of bottom surgery which we've already discussed and it comes from the greek meta which means towards and oidian which means ah. male genitalia so i had no idea did you have any idea oh my gosh yeah that's really cool i wondered why it had such a complicated name right. I was like, what does this mean and i never looked in that's really cool okay I love it's something. mad cool I, I specifically i specifically looked it up i mean we like talking about the etymology of these words but i specifically looked this one up because i had no idea what it was talking about yeah. like what the, what the sort of breakdown of those words were i'd never seen that before and yeah meta and oidian which is why you'll cool. sometimes hear it referred to as metaoidioplasty but metoidioplasty right. is just easier to say. Rolls off the tongue a bit. Okay. And that's why it's so being shortened. So it's spelled metoidioplasty then? No, no, no. It's not spelled metoidioplasty. Uh, it, uh, but it, it can be, is what I'm saying. Uh, More commonly, it's metoidioplasty, presumably because it's easier to say. 
But mm. it's interesting that it's also shortened to meta mm. because that's that's the root of the word. It's ah, oh, it's great. It's great. I wonder if Mark Zuckerberg knows about this. I was thinking, <laughs> that that did Facebook so name themselves? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Surely happened, someone's told him by now. <laughs> There's got to be someone inside that company that's been like, Mark, <laughs> would you? Can I talk to you? <laughs> just, just a sec, man. It's too late. It's too late. No. no. <laughs> so from a... Well, actually, I want you to guess this. How many people... How What percentage of trans men oh. in the US do you think have had metoidioplasty? Oh, in the US. In the US. I imagine not many because of healthcare <laughs> reasons. Wow. Well, um, <laughs> uh, As though the UK 10%? is much better. As though the UK is not much better, to be fair. Yeah. Um, ooh. 20%. 20%? Anyone yeah. else? 10%. 10%? Jamie, you got a guess? Oh, that's going to be like under 5%. Really? <gasps> yeah. So an estimated 2% of trans men. This is from one survey. However, oh, wow. 25% would like to have it in the future. Okay. Yeah. That's what I said. Basically. <laughs> 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 you answer the next question. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think yeah, that was it. Sorry. How many? <laughs> You're just thinking so far ahead. Yeah. You know? Keep looking into the future. <laughs> so it's hard to be sure about these numbers because, I mean, it, it, there's often a lot of self reporting in surveys and they're not necessarily the best and extrapolating outwards and it's a small population already. Yeah. It, it's difficult. Yeah. It, it's tough. It, yeah. It's tough to know for sure. But it does seem to be trending upwards. Uh, metoidioplasty, the sort of rates of metoidioplasty. And so I just want to quickly, I guess, go over how it's done, just roughly. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty straightforward in terms of understanding the surgery. You create a neophallus and new penis from existing genitalia. So we've kind of covered it already earlier in the episode. So the clitoris, which is enlarged by hormones, is used to create the penis, and the labia minora is, are used to create the penis skin, mm -hmm. and the Vagina is used for urethral reconstruction, and then the labia majora is used for the scrotum. And then you get prosthetic testicles as well. Oh, cool. It's one of those surgeries that I, that I think about. I'm like, yeah, I like this one. Mm. This one makes sense. Yeah, it's it does, like, this, it? I like what you've done here. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good job. <laughs> you know, like the surgeries where they take someone's foot and they use it as a knee joint. Oh, yes. 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 I've seen that. Yes. I've seen animated versions of that. Yeah. 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 I'm just like, I, I see some surgeries and I'm like, You've done a good job. You understand the human body. Yeah. You know how it works. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> Gonna turn your little your little ankle into a knee. Well, it's more it's it's more in that case it's it's slightly it, it makes less sense, but it makes slightly less sense. But yeah, they've they've taken essentially a joint like yeah the, like, the, like the a foot joint like yeah a swingy yeah. joint and yeah. been like well we've got a perfectly good joint here let's just use it to make a knee <laughs> why not why not. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I think it's very smart. It's very good. Yeah. Good job. Well done, surgeons. <laughs> Can I ask a clarifying yeah, question? Yeah, go for it. What did you say the urethra was made from? Oh, so I said that the vagina was used for urethra reconstruction, but mm. that's not to say that the urethra is made from the vagina. Okay. If that makes sense. Yes, because yeah. I've never heard of that bit. Yeah, so this is um, this is coming from the Cleveland Clinic. This is just how this is just their sort of diagram explainer, which will okay. be up on screen. But we'll go through it in more in more depth in a sec. Sure, no, that makes yeah. sense because yeah. pretty much like every clinic in different countries does it in a slightly different way. Mm. Oh, yeah. wow. so, okay, got it. I mean, I think there are three. Bro there are broadly like three main ways of doing it, mm -hmm. but we'll we'll get to that in a sec. And how is it done? As I said, is relatively straightforward. You need to be on hormone therapy for at least a year. Uh, to right. give you the bottom growth, obviously. Yeah. And I I don't know if places have it as set as more than a year or maybe some that are less than a year, but a year seems to pretty consistently be the limit that I've seen. Is that so it's, it gets to a point where it stops growing? I I don't know if it's to, if, if it get for it to get to a point where it stops growing or because I I think some. I've heard I think I've heard sort of people saying that it that it continued to grow after a year, but right. it's I think it's more just to have the growth have because some it's there. Yeah. yeah, just just to have the growth in and of itself. Yeah. So we've we've kind of discussed all of that. So in metoidioplasty, a penis is created from a hormonally enlarged clitoris and the labia majora are used to create the scrotum in which you would then put the testicular implants. And there's also usually urethral lengthening, which then allows one to pee whilst standing up and also Ooh. pee using the penis. Not all of that is cool. strictly required though. You can opt out of the urethral lengthening and leave the labia as they are. Although if you opt out of the urethral lengthening, you can't then have it I, I don't think you're then able to have it lengthened afterwards. Right. So that's that's kind of a decision you ha you'd have to make. You can. Can you? But it's compli yes, you can. It's complicated right. though. They Look need to they need to reopen mm -hmm. the created penis 
and like typically the urethral graft that they take needs to be longer. Right. See, because I just yeah, so, it's uh, complicated. Th- this is this is the difficulty with this is why <laughs> this is why it's really difficult because there's so many different places that are giving advice on yeah. what they do. Yeah. So I've had to go yeah. to I mean I've gone to places in the UK. The UK is actually terrible for it in terms of how the, how good they are for giving you information on other things. Oh, really? The the NHS website has basically no information on this. Mm. They just say you can get it. Which right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks guys. Yeah, it's like that. Yeah, good but good I assume job. not from them. I don't know about that no, actually. It is available on the, NHS. On the yeah? Is it? Mm-hmm. Oh wow, yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. Great. Oh no, yeah, we no, we discussed that we discussed that in the Dysphoria episode with Noah. Um, what was that? Um, cool. Two months ago. About two months ago. Yeah. About two months ago. Yeah. So we, yeah, we discussed that there. There, there aren't a ton of those surgeries that are included on on the on the NHS, but I think top surgery and bottom surgery are the two that are, that are right. definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So this is yeah this is what's really difficult about it because so many different places have slightly different ways of doing it and whatnot. So the the one of the places that I was looking at was basically saying that the way that they do the surgery and lengthen the urethra, it becomes much harder if not impossible to do so afterwards the way they've done it Mm -hmm. because they because of the tissue that they use to create the urethra i think it would be used elsewhere or not be available to be used if you complete the surgery without it first right yeah Yeah. and anyway it's 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 (laughs) it's really difficult to talk about this in sort of specifics and this is this is exactly how it goes because obviously you've got different surgeons doing surgeons doing it slightly differently and then different clinics that have different requirements mm-hmm. and it's a bit it's a bit it's it's not a surgery that's just got one strict and straightforward way of doing it but then top yeah. surgery is the same lots of surgeries are similar in that they can kind of differ slightly based on who is doing the surgery mm-hmm. dingling ling is that the ad bell it Hark. sure is it's the ad bell well the ad gods have asked us to promote our patreon on this episode hell yes thanks to our patrons over at patreon.com forward slash side guys you get side guys every single week but if you become a patron you can get a whole host of other things what can they get if they join our patreon an extra episode a month you can get access to our super secret patreon podcast after dark just because side guys has ended doesn't mean the conversation has that's right and you could also vote on episode topics submit episode topics for the vote and some patrons can just Get rid of democracy altogether and tell us exactly what episode they want us to make. You get bonus clips, behind the scenes stuff, lots of cool stuff over on our Patreon. You should definitely go and check it out right now. Patreon.com forward slash side guys. Don't miss it. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start the show again. <laughs> so, the history of metoidioplasty. Does anyone know anything about the history of it? Oh, not in the slightest, no. Any guesses as to when it was first mentioned? Uh, 1916. 1973. Oh. So, yeah, it was first mentioned in 1973 by Durfee and Rowland, and then first performed by Laub sometime before 1989, but I'm not exactly sure when. Mm -hmm. It was really hard to find the information on this for some reason. I just, it was really tough to find... Good. I mean, there were there were some good papers discussing sort of how it was done, but the history of the history of it is a little bit more murky. But I'll take you through how it kind of developed. So Laub did these procedures in stages, and you couldn't. It says voiding. So in all of the papers, instead of urinating, it says voiding, and that just seems to be the term that they use for it, mm. which I find interesting. Voib. Void. Yeah. Void. Yeah, like to void one's bladder. Oh, I see. So it was initially performed in stages and you couldn't stand and pee after the first stage. So that came later, essentially. And then... Well, you could. You just get... You just smell bad and look and get all soggy. (laughs) Thank you, Luke. (laughs) Sorry. Technically, anyone can stand up and pee. That's my contribution. (laughs) Anyone can stand and pee if they want to. Excellent (laughs) advice. (laughs) And it, it was just... It was just kind of done by a number of different surgeons over the years by Bowman by Haig over the years and, and and changed slightly and improved sort of iteratively right different iterations uh solved problems from i say problems but solved potential complications or limitations from previous sort of ways of performing the surgery yeah. and then in 1999 
two different, two separate surgeons reported good results in the appearance of external genitalia, but the neophallus was usually small and curved because of the intact urethral plate. And so they were sort of working on it more and more. And I think by roughly about 2003, it became, the, the sort of success rates got quite a bit higher. And the, ure- the u- sort of urethral construction or urethral reconstruction was kind of mod the way that they did that was modified such that it became quite a bit better because there were with these kinds of surgeries there are a few parts of them that are at higher risk for complications so mm-hmm. with top surgery nipples are the ones that are n- nipples are always the okay. not always <laughs> nipples are usually the issue for complications right okay. so that's why you'll see some people just not having their nipples reattached you need to be no. careful with them yeah mm. they're like don't 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 take any risks they might fall off yeah <laughs> that's like a that's like a lie you tell to children to make them not be <laughs> naughty yeah you, no, what a problem to have. now be good be good luke or your nipples will fall off no <laughs> my pointless male nipples <laughs> What will so, I do without them? So the urethra, the lengthening of the urethra, there could be complications within that. So yeah. that's why this sort of new way of doing that by around 2003 was was resulting in a lot of higher success rates. And so, they, I mean, it was continued to be changed slightly. Uh, the skin grafts became better. Um, you know, they started using different parts of the body for the skin grafts. Mm-hmm. And the latest sort of techniques resulted in us being able to do it in one stage safely um which is pretty mad you could apparently um latest so this is a quote here it says latest advances in surgical techniques and pre uh, perioperative care so that's care around the surgery so before and after the surgery enabled safe one stage gender affirmation surgery metodioplasty with hysterectomy and mastectomy so this is from a paper in 2021 this isn't something that happens regularly i mean waiting lists for one thing also Mm. just that amount of surgery at once is yeah traumatic to the body yeah so Mm. it's not it's not something that you're going to go out and get but the this the point here is that the surgeries have gotten to the point where they're they're quite good at them Mm. you know they're they're they've they've ironed out all the kinks basically yeah but that's what i think is really cool because these surgeries are they're they're something that people are getting more often now and you're more able to they're becoming more accessible than they were you know a while ago not to say that they're very accessible now yeah. but ideally the accessibility to them is going to be increasing over you know the next few decades yeah and it's just as we as we do these kinds of things more we just get better and better and better and better at it and i just think it's it's honestly brilliant would you say it's a would you say it's a a surgery that is um because it's quite rare is it still sort of there's still a lot of evolution in it going on obviously every surgery is going to be evolution as, as people develop new techniques but is this one because of because it's like number of trans people is a small portion and then like you said only a small proportion of those people actually have the surgery is it is it sort of is it quite a fast fast developing place do you know I what mean, i mean do you know what yeah, i'm asking i guess i understand your question i don't think i don't think i know enough about surgery to comment on that to be perfectly mm. honest i don't mm. know how much it's changed over time I, I mean i don't know how the change that's been seen over time with these surgeries compares to say other surgeries just because i don't know anything about yeah. other surgeries but yeah. jamie if you were you looking at this for a while did you see many changes whilst just in the time between you discovering it and you know no. sort of researching it no i mean the 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 reason why I put off having it for so long is I could not find proper information about what it actually involved. Mm. Like, so like the, the team in the UK, they will not do it in one go. And mm-hmm. I could find information about teams that will do it all in one surgery, but I couldn't find out what the UK teams did and what that involved. So like, I don't actually know if it's changed in like the last seven, eight years since I first started looking into it because I could not find much information at all about it at the time. That's, that's really interesting, because I find this a surprisingly difficult episode. So usually the way that mm. when, when these sort of patron vote episodes come up, I can usually gauge, oh, this is going to be an easy one. Oh, this is going to be a tough one. I looked at this one and I thought, surgery, easy. Yeah. Information everywhere. There's yeah. like, Surgeries are usually super easy because you can watch walkthroughs of how they, how they happen on YouTube. You can see yeah. things from the NHS that tell people who are going to get them what it's like. Yeah. And it's, it's just, it's really straightforward and easy. This one was so difficult. Really? So many of the studies, if you look at it, so many of the studies that I've got are from the last 40 years, which I often try to do. But in this case, I didn't have to make any effort whatsoever. They're, this is just when they're all from. And there aren't 
there aren't a huge number of them that walk through sort of exactly what is done. But yeah, I mean, it's it is I think probably a lot better than it was maybe seven or eight years ago. You know, mm. like it seems mm. like there has been a lot more published in recent years. Yeah. And I guess the clinics online have a decent degree of information, but unfortunately, they don't necessarily they don't necessarily differentiate between what they do and what is done <laughs> what, right yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean it makes sense that they wouldn't necessarily because it's it's irrelevant it's, it's largely irrelevant to patients but it is it, it is difficult when you're trying to get an overview being like what what is what is normal for this kind of surgery but i mean kind of what that takes me on to is what i've mentioned a little bit earlier which is i think it's really interesting that a lot of these surgeries aren't usually developed initially for trans people so they're usually adapted from or improved due to surgeries for cis people so i mean if you think about it mastectomies are they could be given to anyone really you know mm -hmm. like any any kind of person that would need a mastectomy but there's uh, have you heard of gynecomastia gynecomastia is when is it males start developing breast tissue yeah exactly yeah. and so you could have you could have top surgery to remove the breast tissue and reconstruct a typically male yeah, chest I guess so. that would be where that that surgery has come from you've got uh urethral urethral lengthening well if you've got a hypospadia that's where that comes from micro penis that's where that's where that comes from the, all of these like so many of these surgeries and then there's also intersex people so we do this thing this this really cheery cool fun thing where we take babies that don't look typical mm. um and we oh we just do some surgeries on them to make them look like how we think they should mm. look like but then but then that's not to say that uh, surgeries for intersex people are necessarily bad it's just the consent issue that's that's a problem mm -hmm. but uh, yeah so surgeries for intersex people could then be uh, sort of translated into surgeries for trans people uh, it's it's just really interesting to me that i don't think there's been a single time i've ever looked into a surgery for trans people for this episode uh, for this episode for this podcast mm. and ever found that they were initially <laughs> intended for trans, trans people, people yeah, yeah. I, I mean off the top of my head i can't even really think of a single one what about facial feminization surgery was that that exists. I suppose it's that's just, just that's cosmetic surgery, facial yeah. cosmetic surgery. I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, and it's it's not its own surgery. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it's just it's what's interesting to me is that it tells us that our bodies are more similar than we yeah. think. I'm led to believe, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so shall we talk a little bit about metoidioplasty again? Yes, yeah, let's go. Come back to that, yeah? yeah. So let's do it a little bit step by step. So first, we are. Before metoidioplasty, obviously, that's mm. how you start a journey. You gotta have the, <laughs> you gotta have the bit before. So this is from the Cleveland Clinic. So it might differ for you. It might differ for I say you. It's not gonna differ for you, Jamp. It's gonna differ for no. people listening. It depends on where you are. All that sort of stuff. So with the Cleveland Clinic, they give you a physical exam to sort of learn more about your health and assess your medical history. And you then you're then educated on the risks and the benefits and all of the sort of requirements for the surgery and you know the post-surgery care you also have a mental health evaluation uh this is again with the cleveland clinic i don't uh, this this is something that very much could be different elsewhere you've got to have taken hormone therapy for at least at least one year as i've said already live for at least one year in a manner consistent with your gender identity which is similar to the uk sort of guidelines mm. for how we how we uh, sort of do surgeries and whatnot we yeah. were discussing this in our dysphoria episode which yeah. you could check out uh, then you also get health recommendations, which include quitting smoking, losing weight, and things like that to lower your risk of complications. And this is this is something that we've actually you actually hear a lot about, especially with sort of top surgeries. There's there's this whole thing with weight and top surgery right, right now, which I'm not going to get mm -hmm. super into, but I would recommend sort of looking I think into it. That's standard, um, quite standard pre-surgery advice anyway isn't it yeah 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 absolutely you'll also get your sort of standard surgery health recommendations like quitting smoking and losing weight to reduce the risk of potential complications mm -hmm. so i found a paper that said there were three different types of three broadly three kinds of metoidioplasty but that might just be what they were looking at in this paper again it's really difficult to get to nail down one sort of process or one group of processes or anything like that because yeah. ultimately it, it, so many different people are doing this it's just it's it's hard to sort of uh, pin it down so you've got simple metoidioplasty ring metoidioplasty or belgrade or belgrad metoidioplasty has anyone heard of any of these before i have heard of the third one. Oh, oh. good but I, I don't know what it means i've just heard that 
term. Well, um, and now I'm like, oh my goodness, do I know anything about the surgery I have had? <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. <laughs> You're just finding out that you let some doctors do whatever to you. <laughs> <laughs> what type did I have? Oh my god. <laughs> well, it says here that actually they install a little bell. So... I don't know. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's what that sound is. Okay. Not some, oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here comes Jamie. <laughs> it rings every time. You... <laughs> okay. So, simple metodioplasty is performed, and this is just a quote from the paper. It is performed on a good-sized clitoris, which is enlarged by preoperative use of testosterone. But then it goes on to subcoronal skin incision, followed by degloving and transection of clitoral suspensory ligaments. Oh, so I, I think I do know what this one is, but mm-hmm. I think it's like typically said like a simple release, yeah, where the clitoris is just released from the ligaments, so it's kind of more free, you know, just chilling out down there. Yeah. Yeah. Free, yeah. Free him. yeah. 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 So that <laughs> literal so, free willy. Yeah. So this is what I this is what I do with my this is what I do with a lot of my notes. I write down I, I'll write a lot of things down in my own words. Some things I'll use as quotes, and I'll often I'll say I'll tell you when I'm giving you a quote. And sometimes I do a mix of both. And in this case, <laughs> I was reading and I had in my head, ah, yeah, I know what this means. And then you read words like subcoronal skin incision followed by degloving and transaction of clitoral suspensory ligaments. Oh, You're like, oh, that's so many words. Hold on, oh. give me two seconds. Oh, but yeah, no, Jimmy, you're absolutely... <laughs> Shakespeare in the room with us. <laughs> uh, you're absolutely spot on. Uh, and then it says the urethral plate is dissected ventrally, ventral uh, being on the underside. So do you know how animals have dorsal fins? And, yes. Yeah, yes. and dorsal plates. Yes. Dorsal is the top side. Ventral is the bottom side. Yeah. Right. Oh yes, I think I got them mixed up. But yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so like a dolphin's dorsal fin is uh, is a dorsal fin because it's yes. on the top of the dolphin. Yeah. If it had a fin on the bottom, it would be a ventral fin. Mm. Ooh. Yeah. So with this one, they yeah, it's like Jamie said, they basically just make the sort of simple incision just to free, just to essentially free it, and yeah. th- because there's these sort of ligaments that hold that holds the clitoris in place in a certain way that when you remove them, it's held in a different way. So you don't necessarily get lengthening with it, but you kind of, it doesn't make the actual, you're not lengthening the actual structure, but I think you can make it appear longer by right. it, it not being held back or down, yes. essentially. Like yeah, the thing yeah. on yeah. the bottom of your tongue. Mm. Yeah, so you've got the friend, that, that's kind of like a frenulum, yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. yeah. And, they, and your mm. tongue's not longer, it's just, it's all going down here, but if you cut that, oh yeah. Ugh, don't. Oh, that's that's lovely. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> and with this, what they do is they leave the native urethral opening. And you can have future lengthening on that, but they leave the native urethral, uh, they, they leave the native opening. So what that essentially means is that, yeah, it's it's just the sort of, it's just freeing, it's just freeing that there. Mm-hmm. So it says, and this is from the paper, it says, despite its limitations, this technique provides a complication-free gender confirmation surgery with acceptable cost and fast and safe recovery, which is which is a pretty, uh, I think, succinct description of it. Yeah. It doesn't give you the full aesthetic changes that the other surgeries will give, mm-hmm. but it does it does give a lot of, it, does, it, it has way fewer complications because, as mm-hmm. I said, the main, main risk when it comes to complications is the urethra, which I think is why a lot of, a lot of different sort of surgeons will do it in three stages rather than doing some in, in, in will do it in the sort of three stages because you've got to, I think it's to give time to heal between certain, between certain stages of, yeah. Of the surgery, but it's I think- so the graft can the the graft they make the urethra out of can take, so they like leave it open. So you do one stage where it's like the clitoris is like opened up, the urethral graft is put in, and then they leave it for a bit to heal, mm. so that when they close it up, so you can actually pee, it's it's already healed up. Mm. Basically. Oh wow! Oh yeah. awesome! Yeah, handy. So. One of the main disadvantages that's pointed out in in this surgery is that you wouldn't then be able to stand to pee without getting your legs smelly, like Lucas said, I suppose. (laughs) (laughs) My fantastic contribution earlier. Yeah, Yeah, and you can add then another stage with the urethral urethral lengthening, but obviously in, in this case, you could have this surgery and you can get like, you know, a number of changes, but just maybe not necessarily all the changes that you might want. Mm -hmm. But people, people are individuals. It's down to them to weigh up the risks and benefits you know themselves and then also it comes into non-binary people as well i've seen a lot of i've seen actually a really good number of papers mention non-binary people which i think is 
Very good. Because mm. usually, usually there's a struggle to even mention trans pe- uh, transgender people in a way that is <laughs> remotely understandable as to what the hell they're talking about. Yeah. So the fact that uh, papers talking about this kind of surgery are mentioning non-binary people is pretty cool. I'm I'm glad that I'm glad that they're thinking of it. Progress. So there's the simple. That's it. The simple release or the simple metodioplasty. It is it, uh, it, not just one cut, but it's it's more or less just a snipping and freeing of the clitorophallus there. Mm-hmm. So there's also then ring metoidioplasty, which is similar to simple metoidioplasty, but there are some differences there. So the main difference between ring metoidioplasty and simple metoidioplasty is just the the urethral lengthening. So that's basically what all of the changes are there. And there are obviously more compl- complications associated with that. So there's a urethral fistula. It could be 10 to 20%. Do you know what a fistula is? No. It's essentially when a, a, a passageway opens up between two organs, that, or ah, it, it, basically you, yeah. you've got a, a passageway opening, a passageway opening up that shouldn't open up. Yeah. So yeah, if you've yeah. got, if let's say, gosh, what is an what is an organ that you wouldn't want being attached to your urethra? Oh, stomach probably. Sure, stomach to urethra. There you go. There that would be a fistula, but yeah. <laughs> that's not necessarily. <laughs> that's not saying. I'm not saying that would happen, but that's uh, that. That's ten to twenty six percent. So there are slightly more. There's a there's slightly higher risk of complication uh, complications, but you can also have revisions if there are complications. It's not like if there are complications that means it's automatically. Mm. unsalvageable bad it it just means that you might have to have um further revisions and yeah. and, and whatnot it, it's complications not you know um and, and sort of a, a complete a complete sort of roadblock stop yeah. but in 30 percent of in almost 30 percent of individuals it, it says here urethral complications are a problem with voiding while standing being the main post-operative issue so that's that is that is where the main sort of issue would come from there's also a scrotoplasty with testicle implants which could be done as a separate procedure so if it, if it is done it would always be done as a separate procedure it says here uh, but there's a pretty good outcome you know there's a lower chance of complications with mm-hmm. ring metodioplasty there in uh, with the scrotal um with the scrotal sort of uh, construction and then there's belgrade or belgrad metodioplasty and that is usually used to repair severe form of uh, severe forms of hypospadias and it it's a, a multi. It's essentially a multi-stage process, rather than the single-stage one. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess it's more similar to how I was describing metodioplasty at the beginning. Just the sort of uh, the way that all of the parts are used, essentially. Yeah. yeah to remember that from up top. You can yes. go back and yeah. listen. Yeah, That's yeah, fine. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> if my memory so, doing so, it again. <laughs> and in this one, they use labial and clitoral skin to reconstruct the penile body. Yeah. Um, and then they also then we'll uh, do a scrotoplasty just by joining both labia majora and then they add silicone implants uh, wow. through the midline or using separate incisions above the labia uh, to add the scrotal, uh, to add the, uh, what they called? The testicle implants. Yeah. And then they'll also use a vacuum pump after operation to protect, uh, to basically stop it from, uh, re- stop the neophallus from retracting. Uh, and you start doing that three weeks after surgery. Mm-hmm. So this one is I guess it's sort of just increasing essentially in um, the amount of stuff that you have would have done. So I think that it, it, to put it really simply, simple a simple metodioplasty, as we as you sort of called it, is essentially just the freeing of the uh, is the freeing of the clitoris to create mm-hmm. um, to create a penis there. And then ring metodioplasty is then doing that and then kind of adding in the um, adding in the urethra yeah. and. Uh, Belgrade metodioplasty. There were a few. There were a few other differences as well. But essentially, that's that's all of that plus the uh, sort of scrotum. sewing together. Yes, yeah, sewing yeah. together with the labia majora to make the scrotum. Quick question: um, Do when when you're doing this, do, do they seal up the vagina completely? So it depends on which what which, which kind you're getting, and that's yeah, the, the main... one where you get testicles. Yeah. Not always. It's a it's a personal choice. Um, they typically won't want to seal the vaginal opening unless you get urethral lengthening, because right. there can be complications in terms of like infections and things mm. if you move your urethra but you keep the opening there. And mm. then obviously you'd need to have a hysterectomy. Um, yeah. But 
people leave it open people get it closed it just depends i just find it really interesting that you can close it not physically but like that 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 is a thing that doesn't then cause other problems um but i don't really know anything about it so yeah but i just i find that interesting i would have thought they had to leave it open so why don't we talk a little bit about the advantages and complications just generally of metodioplasty because it's not the only kind of bottom surgery that's available yeah. to uh, trans men or trans mass people or anyone that really wants <laughs> that wants that kind of bottom surgery. There's also phalloplasty. And so let's let's talk just briefly about the sort of advantages and complications associated specifically with um, metodioplasty. Okay. Yeah? So don't take these risks as oh this is no <laughs> everything has risks. We're it's you need to talk about the risks, <laughs> but there's also a lot of benefits from it. So you could have urethral stricture or which is a narrowing due to scarring or right. a fistula which is connecting the urethra to uh, the, we've spoken about that connection between the urethra and other organs. Yeah. And you can uh, have a risk of UTIs, uh, difficulties with sexual function, but I, I feel, I, I, as far as we're aware, the difficulties with sexual function are quite low. Yeah. Uh, it, it, they're not terribly common, from what I've from what I've read. I mean, I haven't. I've, most people I've seen talking about it have said they've that it's been a good experience. And I think mm -hmm. the studies that I've read have shown that I think was it about eighty percent of people. A, a lot of people had um, it, experienced sort of good sexual function. So another complication is uh, potential dissatisfaction with the results of the surgery, but that's, I mean, the, any kind of cosmetic surgery, which I mean, is yeah, any kind of like sort of cosmetic surgery has that sort of has that risk, you know, mm. or any kind of surgery where it's, it's done to change the look, of, it has that risk. So yeah. it, it's almost, it's almost negligible. It's almost not worth mentioning, but it's something that is mentioned yeah. uh, in in a number of places. I guess because you're kind of going in with an ex with not like an expectation, but an idea of like what you want it to look like. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And if it doesn't look exactly like how you wanted it, yeah, it's yeah. disappointing. So the advantages are having genitalia that it's aesthetically pleasing. That's <laughs> like I've literally copied that from another web from from a website. <laughs> uh, Weird way of putting it. Yeah, well, that's a very weird way of putting it. Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> like oh man, like you're showing everyone. Look at look at me, <laughs> you know, and everyone's like. Well, that's but it's also like it's also around. like suggesting that you might have had genitalia that to some people might have been uh, aesthetically pleasing before the surgery, no, but no, no, you didn't want it. It's it's, so. it's, it's <laughs> look, it's talking about aesthetically pleasing to, to the person getting the sur surgery. Yes, of course. No, yeah, I yeah. know. I just mean yeah, aesthetically pleasing to you is is quite a crucial. It's you know. Yeah. I don't, it, it feels like it feels like. <laughs> Oh, why do why do trans people not like not like parts of their bodies? It's because it doesn't look it doesn't look nice. Yeah, That's yeah, it's the a issue. Bit reductive, mm. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, very reductive. Uh, preserving sensation as well, which is uh, it's the main one, and then being able to urinate while standing. So, because you're with with metodioplasty, because you are using just the the exact same tissue, and you're not removing it from the body or or, or sort of moving it anywhere really. Yeah, you are you're preserving the sensation there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Whereas with phalloplasty, you'd usually that you take from it's some flesh from the arm or from yeah. the leg, and you can still have sensation with phalloplasty. Absolutely. It's just that with metodioplasty, you are more likely to have the same sensation. Yeah. It's so it was like, like not the same density of nerves, nerves and stuff. Right? It's yeah. Different, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. The recovery. We could talk. Uh, we could talk really briefly about the recovery. I'll just. I'll just fire through this. So you can, uh, according to the Cleveland Clinic, you should be able to walk and do light activity after about a week and resume normal oh, activities yeah. after about six weeks. No. <laughs> no. 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 Well, I don't know. I had a complication, but like I was waddling for three weeks okay. and I couldn't drive for six weeks <sighs> after my first stage, which was Jesus. release and creation of the scrotum that mm -hmm. I had in my first stage. And that, like, it, it wasn't that quick. It was quite a brutal recovery. Oh, really? Jesus. Loads and loads of, like, bruising. It was painful. It was significantly worse than my top surgery. Wow. But I don't know if that's a universal experience. Mm. I had a complication that probably delayed me by about a week because I was in hospital for a week mm -hmm. with a hematoma and I had to have another surgery. But even after that, the three weeks at home were very uncomfortable i couldn't get out of bed properly i couldn't go to the toilet and it was a lot longer than a week oh, <laughs> no. well, i mean yeah. i've seen i've seen pictures of the i've seen pictures of the different stages of the surgery which i i'm not going to share in the video just because they're they're bloody but um yeah no having seen the, st the pictures of the stage of the surgery it does not look like a surgery that is quick and easy to um recover from, recover from. yeah just because there's a lot of, there's a lot of parts being sort of moved and and, and mm. sutured and, and it's mm -hmm. very sensitive it's yeah, a really yeah. sensitive part of the body 
Yeah. yeah. And there's always something, there's always, always something touching that part of the body. Like you've, yeah. the clothes that you wear, you're, you know what I mean? And even then, your legs walking around, you're like, rub, it's just, there's there's no getting away from that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting that you said about the, the pit, like not showing the pictures, because I, I remember Googling this because I was just interested to see what the results were like. Um, and so much when you search for pictures, it's like the process of the surgery as opposed to the pictures. And that must be so off-putting because it's not like when you search, you know, nose job, you see a load of pictures of someone's face open and like the internal structure of their nose. But yeah, I mean, I remember Googling it and being like, whoa, that's not, people are wanting to see what they'll look like, not mm -hmm. that. Like, yeah. That, yeah. Mm. I got a lot of it from Tumblr. That's where I found actually a lot of like oh, wow. the mm -hmm. recovered um, surgeries. But mm. everything that, like, if you just Google it or you try and casually find things without knowing where to look, it's either mid-surgery, directly after surgery, oh, or God. it's a cartoon animation yeah. that people do. Yeah. Or, like, a diagram. Yeah. yeah. I found a good yeah. one. I, I found quite a good one of, uh, in, in, in some papers, but that was only after, it was only after the full surgery. So I, you, you scroll through all the pictures of the full surgery and you just see the full process. But right. yeah, it is not easy to find just pictures without all of the, with, without all of the other stuff sort of attached. Yeah. So those would be the sort of, those are the complications and the advantages, obviously. So preserving sensation, being able to urinate while standing. And we've kind of gone into the recovery. So this is just, I'm going to read this just really quickly. This is from a study done on over 800 trans men. I think it's from 2021. Yes, it is. Metodioplasty, surgical options, and outcomes in 813 cases. So reading this out, follow-up range from 16 to 118 months, a mean of 94 months, mean surgery time was 170 minutes, and mean hospital stay was three days. Look at that. Mm. You're above average, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> well, Congratulations. I did not want to be above average on that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, length of the neophallus ranged from 4.8 centimeters to 10.2 centimeters with a mean of 5.6 centimeters. Urethroplasty was complication free in 89.5% of cases and ranged between 81 to 90.3% in different groups. And uh, will not, I won't go into all of the specifics of the sort of complications. But what I will say is that from the 655 patients who answered the questionnaire, 79% were totally satisfied and 20% mainly satisfied with the results of the surgery. So I totally undersold that earlier. No, it was, it's 99% uh, uh, of them are. Are satisfied. Mm -hmm. I, not, I had sinus surgery and I'm not satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> so like that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you should have had just some just some therapy, huh? Maybe you didn't need the mm. sinus surgery. Mm, you're right. Yeah. 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 It was all those all the trauma blocking up my nostrils. <laughs> mm. Have you tried living in the role of someone who has clean sinuses? Yeah. Sorry. You need to do that you're for a right. year before we can give you. Oh, you're so right. <laughs> oh my god. I was poorly advised. <laughs> Uh, and all patients reported voiding in standing position and good sexual arousal of the neophallus without possibility for penetrative intercourse due to small size of the neophallus. I don't... I, I, okay, when you read studies and all of that, it says that there is no possibility for penetration. When you go to Reddit and other groups, I did a lot of different research for this episode. Oh. Um, you'll, you will find people saying that they... That they they can have penetrative sex so oh, wow i think it's down this is just like when scientists discovered the clitoris and all of the women were like <laughs> we know uh, all of the science stuff you've learned you've read is like you can't do it and then reddit's like mm. but you can yeah. trans men are like yeah you can yeah nah. <laughs> you'll discover this there'll be a documented thing of this in about 20 years we'll yeah. go wow we've just discovered that trans men can have sex and all the trans men are like Yes. <laughs> yes, we know. Thank you. What a discovery. Congratulations. Yeah, I mean, just the, the, it's it's odd to me because they say that the maximum length was about 10 centimeters, which is about four inches. Yeah. And saying that there's no possibility of penetration with four inches is just... That's... 10 centimeters is incredibly impressive from like growing <laughs> from a clitoris. Yeah, so uh, so yeah, the from this study of 800 over 800 trans guys, which for studies on trans people is a stupid high number. That's massive. Yeah. Mm. That's less I mean, how many people did you have in 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 your study, Jamie? Which one? Oh yeah, you did. Well, it, what Ooh, was the wow, maximum? What, a flex. <laughs> <laughs> what was the what was the, the, the what was the maximum number of uh, trans people you had in in any of the sort of studies that you've done? Oh god, survey ones. It was quite a lot. It mm -hmm. it was 
I I know I had like a total in the thousands, but that did include cis wow. participants as well. Mm. But I do seem to remember it wasn't like the typical ratio to, you'd expect. I don't want to oversell myself, but I, <laughs> I got a reasonable amount. But 800 for people who have had a very... Oh yeah, is it uncommon surgery? Yeah, mm. I'm incredibly impressed. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, yeah. bear in mind that it's two percent of people in America, two percent of trans men in America have had. Wow. Uh, yeah. Which the fact that that is, I mean, I, I I can never do scale off the top of my head. My brain does not just does not naturally care about scale. It's irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> it's irrelevant. So, but it feels I like see size. No, <laughs> I, I, I know, it's annoying. It's it's genuinely irritating, but it happens. So the fact that it's 800, 800 trans guys. That have had metodioplasty. The fact that only two percent of trans guys in the U.S. have had that, mm. and they got eight hundred people. That's that feels like that should be everyone and then that's some. all of them. That's, yeah. that's all. That's them, yeah. them all. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but no, obviously it's not. Got them all. So what no. what you could see from this huge huge survey, huge study from twenty twenty one is that ninety nine percent of people are satisfied with the surgery, and everyone has good sexual function, which mm. that's good. There you go. We have to stop them getting it in case the one percent regret it. <laughs> <laughs> Just You're in right. case. Just in case. <laughs> so, I also find some frequently asked questions, and this is from GRS Montreal. So that's where this is coming from. Uh, this is not necessarily going to be the same for everyone, but I thought there were some interesting parts here. So we'll just I'll just fire through these, yeah. and that'll be the last thing I want to talk about. So, will my clitoris be longer after the metodioplasty? It's, the answer is no, but the complete release of the clitoral ligament places the clitoris in a more advanced position, which gives the impression that it's longer, which is kind of what I was talking about earlier. It doesn't, mm. doesn't give... It, they don't physically go in and add length. Yeah, it's yeah. the same length that is always there. It's just freed so Releasing that there is... It. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you can, it, this, we've already covered this as well. Can you have metodioplasty without closing the vaginal cavity? So you absolutely can do that. Yep. Uh, the lifespan of the testicular implants is, uh, it says that they can be left in place for as long as no complications arise. Uh, so if you do have a problem with one or both implants, they'll go and see your doctor. Really good. In terms of medications, you'll be given, you'll just be given antibiotics and painkillers generally and anti-inflammatories, that sort of, your general sort of post-surgery yeah. medication. Yeah. And then how, with the urinary catheter, so if you've got a urinary catheter, you could, you could keep that in from 10 days to three weeks mm -hmm. after the surgeries apparently, but then that can differ obviously depending on your surgeon and, and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, another question is uh, will you be able to orgasm after metodioplasty? Yes, Ooh. because uh, the erectile and erogenous nature of the clitoris is maintained, which allows for sexual pleasure, which is one of the advantages we were talking about there. Yeah. Um, and this one I found really interesting. This is the reason I wanted to talk. Uh, I wanted to do these sort of frequently asked questions is because there's a question here. Will it be possible to ejaculate during orgasm after my surgery? And so it says, no ejaculatory fluid, uh, ejaculatory fluid expelled by the penis during sexual stimulation will not be possible since internal male structures such as prostate, se seminal vesicles, and glands are absent. However, a clear fluid may flow from the urethra. This fluid comes from the skein's gland, which are normally preserved during surgery and may be expelled in a variable amount from one person to another. So, Oh, wow. Yeah, so the skein's gland, I've, I've just, I'll just read this quote here from uh, a, a sort of anatomy uh, resource I found. The skein's glands, which are also known as the lesser vestibular glands, homologous to the prostate glands in males, are two glands located on either side of the urethra. These glands are believed to secrete a substance to lubricate the urethra opening. This substance is also believed to act as an antimicrobial. This antimicrobial is used to prevent urinary tract infections. The function of the skein's gland is not fully understood, but is believed to be the source of female ejaculation during sexual arousal. Ah. So... Yeah, I mean, you can, like, it, it's interesting to me that you can, like, I, I didn't, interesting in the sense that I didn't know this until I started yeah. researching this episode, that you could have... I've never heard that. I've never heard Skeen's gland before. That's yeah. the first time I've ever heard of it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's it's mad. And so that would be everything that I have done for this episode. Wow. And I think it's maybe time <gasps> for a quick fire quiz. <gasps> dun, 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 dun. Metodia Plastic Edition. <laughs> I hope I said that right. So the rules for the quick fire quiz are the same as always. I'll ask one question. That's one question between the three of you. The first person to buzz in with the correct answer wins. What did they win, Jamp? One free Metodia Plastic Surgery. Jamp, we can't beat We can't. Just one. No, we can't afford it. Just one. So Luke, what is your buzzer? Ha! Jamp, what is your buzzer? Boing. Jamie, what is your buzzer? <laughs> Ooh. So my question for you today <laughs> is, what is the etymology of metoidioplasty? Oh, I knew it was going to be this. Ah, Luke? Uh, meta, meaning towards, and the other one, I think Latin toid, toidio, meaning uh, male genitalia. So 
I'll give it to you. It's Greek. <laughs> Thank you. And it's Oidon. Greek. But... Oidon. <laughs> Silly. <laughs> Toidon. Toidon. No, to- no Oid. Oid. Oidon. Oidon. Meta Oidon. Yeah, yep. Basti. <laughs> That's how I'm going to say it from now on. What surgery did I have? Yes. Meta Oidon. Meta Oidon. There you go. That is it. Metoidioplasty, meta oidon towards male genitalia. But now we're heading towards the end of our show. So, since this is a patron vote episode, I think it's time to thank some patrons. I want to say a very special and awesome thank you to Errol Getner. Thank you to Ben Clark. Thank you, Elliot Rock. Thank you, Alison Jones. Thank you to Alex Kobe. Thank you, Cayenne. Thank you, Brax. Thank you to August Slater. Thank you, Robin Hargreaves. Thanks, Sophie Walker. And thank you to Kendall. Oh, Aww. a little candle joining Jenna? us. That's nice. Oh, yeah. We went to different directions. We went very different <laughs> oh, Kendall, directions. I love it. <laughs> Topical with the Barbie film. Well, thank you to those new patrons. And before we go, we'd like to thank all of our patrons with an extra special thank you to executive producers Danito and Rosa Rodriguez. And thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday. And why not leave us a nice wee comment? You can support the bot at patreon.com forward slash guys, Or you can find a contact at SciGuysBot on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and at SciGuys on TikTok too. Or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod at gmail.com. You can follow me at NotCorey everywhere. You can follow me at Jamkin everywhere. You can follow me at Luke Cutforth everywhere. I'm Jamie Dodger everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>